Good morning, Bradley Elementary. It's Mr. Saxton here. I'm in my office. I got my hat on, my glasses. Pittsburgh Steelers! And we're going to read some books. Uh, just a public service announcement. Don't forget, if you're not on Google Classroom yet, you should be doing that from kinder through sixth grade. Check out your uh, Google Classroom. You can get there by going to the Bradley website and you can click on the Google Classroom link. Your teacher has the code, or you can use your student ID and birth date to log in. If you have questions, email your teacher or email me uh, at my email address, which can be found on our website. It's very important that you're checking Google Classroom on a daily basis, no matter what grade you are in. Also, tomorrow, if you're a second grader, 9 to 12 or 3 to 4, you can pick up a Chromebook. And if you forgot any of your packets, or you uh, missed the Chromebook last Friday, or you need one of those tablets if you're a kinder and a first grader, you can come get those tomorrow. So it's a makeup day for everything, and we're passing out Chromebooks to second graders. All right, so we got two books for you today. <clears throat> one book is a baseball book. It's called The Field Beyond the Outfield. We'll start there. And then the second one is about Ada Twist, Scientist. So it's kind of a rhyming book. So I'm excited to read these. Don't forget, at 1.30, we're reading Peter and the Star Catchers. We read two chapters yesterday, and we'll pick up again today, uh, depending on how long the chapters are. Uh, it depends on how many we'll read, because I don't want to um, I don't want to read for like 30 or 40 minutes. I know that's hard to pay attention to. Okay, so here we go. The Field Beyond the Outfield by Mark Teague. If you can see here, this is like a giant cockroachy kind of bug. So um, this is going to be interesting, all right? Here we go. It's got a little baseball field there. The field beyond the outfield. When Ludlow Greeby began to complain about the monsters in his closet, and the sharks that swam by outside every time it rained. You can see the sharks in the window there. Ludlow's been complaining about some things. Ludlow put all, oh wait, Mr. Page. His parents decided that he needed something real to think about, so they signed him up to play baseball. There's Ludlow, there's his coach. His parents are like, get outside, do some stuff. Stop daydreaming, which isn't always the best thing. Ludlow put all of his energy into learning the game. He watched the pitches and he counted the strikes and hardly thought about monsters at all. And when he finally got a chance to play outfield for the Oswald County Hornets, Ludlow was ready. A good ball player is always ready. You can kind of see he's looking at a little bug there on his finger. I think Ludlow likes to think about other things. They told him to play back, far, far back to where the weeds got scraggly, and the other players looked small as ants. He's way out there in the outfield next to those weeds. He was so far back, he was almost out of the outfield and into another field altogether. Uh-oh. We're over here. Where another game of baseball was in progress in a towering stadium topped with pennants and filled with monsters of various types. They got another game going on there behind the bushes. It was just what Ludlow had feared might happen, but he reminded himself that a good ball player must always keep his mind on the game. So he watched the pitches and counted the strikes. And when the other fielder asked if he could hit, he told him that, in fact, he could. Look at Ludlow shaking hands with that giant bug who's playing a baseball game. I think Ludlow may be leaving one game and headed to another game. When the inning changed, Ludlow was whisked off to try his luck swinging the bat. That is one big bug to pick up Ludlow. And there he goes. He's getting ready to go bat. 
The monsters in the stands became quiet when Ludlow stepped up to the plate. His stomach growled and his legs felt weak. A little nervous. So he did what all good ball players do. He tipped his hat. He tapped his shoes and grinned, a big league grin. Can you spot the crocodile serving hot dogs? Love those get ready for it. And at bat, look at that umpire has uh, four arms. The pitcher threw a fastball with one hand and a curveball with another. Love those ready. We're going to see what happens here. Turn to whoever you're watching this with and say what you think is going to happen on the next page. What do you think? Tell your parents. Do you think he's going to hit it? Do you think he's going to strike out? Here we go. But Ludlow saw the knuckleball coming, and he swatted it out of the park. I think he just hit a home run. It's a pretty good swing there he's got going, baseball swing. It seemed like the cheering would never stop. But Ludlow had his own game to get back to, and night was coming. His parents smiled at him when he came in from the field. You'll get more action next time, said his father. He's waving goodbye to his friends. His parents are like, you didn't get to play very much, but Ludlow knows what's up. He hit a home run for the green bug team. That night, Ludlow went to bed without complaining, and the monsters in his closet didn't bother him at all. He was ready for what the next day would bring. A good ball player is always ready. There's still some monsters in his closet. He's asleep because he got to hit a home run for the bug team. Okay. All right. So sometimes when you're at home, you get lost in your imagination, which is a good thing. That's where good stories come from. Uh, if you're lost in your imagination. All right. Think about that. If you're, if you're daydreaming of stuff or you're in your imagination, write some of that stuff down. That'd be a good story since we're at home. Okay. And take a cup of coffee there. All right. This one is called Ada Twist Scientist and uh, talks about creativity, perseverance. All right. This is a rhyming book. So we're going to do some rhyming. Here we go. Ada Marie, Ada Marie said not a word till the day she turned three. She bounced in her crib and looked all around, observing the world, but not making a sound. She learned how to climb and made her big break with a trail of chaos left in her wake. She ran through the day chasing each sound in sight and didn't slow down till she conked out at night. She's kind of causing a little havoc there. So this is her as a scientist. A good scientific word is this one here, observing. Good scientist observe the world, which she was doing. Her parents were frazzled but tried not to freak as Ada grew bigger and still did not speak. Clearly, young Ada, with lots in her head, would have something to say when it ought to be said. No, she's not talking, but she's exploring and observing. That's just... What happened when Ada turned three? She tore through the house on a fact-finding spree and climbed up the clock just as high as she could. Her parents yelled, stop, as all good parents would. Ada's chin quivered, but she did not cry. She took a deep breath and simply asked, why? Oh, well, there she is on top of that clock. Her parents are a little freaked out. Her brother's pointing at her. Checking it out there. Why does it tick and why does it talk? Why don't we call it a granddaughter clock? 
Why are there pointy things stuck to a rose? Why are there hairs up inside of your nose? She started with why and then what, how, and when. By bedtime, she came back to why once again. She drifted to sleep as her dazed parents smiled at the curious thoughts of their curious child. Who wanted to know what the world was about? They kissed her and whispered, you'll figure it out. Why, why, why? There's some nose hairs. Why does a magnet work? Why do plants grow? What is this on an elephant? How does a light work? Those are good questions that you can have if you're at home right now, right? Her parents kept up with their high-flying kid, whose questions and chaos both grew as she did. So we got what, why, what, how, when, and why. And then over here, what does it do? How soon is now? Can I? Why does it? How? What will it be? What if? Why? They are. She's got lots and lots of questions. And this is the universe it looks like she's got going on there. Even Miss Greer found her hands were quite full when young Ada's chaos wreaked havoc at school. But this much was clear about Miss Ada Twist. She had all the traits of a great scientist. Oh my, this is Mentos in a Coke bottle. <sighs> but it looks like she's flavored the Coke bottles with different colors to make a rainbow. I suggest you don't try this at home unless your parents give you permission. Ada was busy that first day of spring testing the sounds that mockingbirds sing when a horrible stench whacked her right in the nose, a pungent aroma that curled up her toes. Zowie, said Ada, which got her to thinking, what is the source of that terrible stinking? How does a nose know there's something to smell and does it still stink if there's no nose to tell? She rattled off questions and tapped on her chin. She'd start at the start where she ought to begin. A mystery, a riddle, a puzzle, a quest. This was the moment that Ada loved best. So she's going to try to figure out what is stinky and why does your nose think it's stinky? Those are some good questions in there. Ada did research to learn all she could of smelling and smells, both the stinky and good. A good scientist does research. One hypothesis Ada thought could be true, the terrible stink came from dad's cabbage stew. She tested and tested, but soon Ada knew it was time to come up with hypothesis too. So she's testing dad's cabbage stew. A hypothesis is a guess, a very scientific guess about why something happens. Then Zowie, the stink, struck again just like that. Hypothesis two, it's caused by the cat. The cat couldn't make much such a stink on its own. It needed perfume and some fancy cologne. So young Ada tested. The test was a flop. She started again, but her parents yelled, stop. So she's testing out to see if the cat stinks, and she's going to clean the cat. Do not put your cat in the dishwasher or the washer machine, I guess that is. All right. Ada Marie, Ada Marie, to the thinking chair now by the time we count three. Enough, said her mother. That's it, said her dad. Her parents were frustrated, frazzled, and mad. Why? Ada questioned. Her mother said, no. What? Ada queried. Her father said, no. You've ruined our supper. You've made the cat stink. Enough with your questions. Now sit there and think. She looked at her parents. Her heart turned to goo. Poor Ada Twist didn't know what to do. Uh-oh, some people are not happy with her because of all her questioning and inquisitiveness. She sat all alone by herself in the hall, and Ada once more could say nothing at all. And so Ada sat, and she sat, and she sat, and she thought about science and Stu and the cat, and how her experiments made such a big mess. Does it have to be so? Is that part of success? Our mess is a problem, and while she was thinking, what was the source of that terrible stinking? Ada Marie did what scientists do. She asked a small question, and then she asked two, and each of those led her to three questions more, and some of those questions resulted in four. As Ada got thinking, she really dug in. She scribbled her questions and tapped on her chin. 
She started at why and then what, how, and when. At the end of the hall, she reached why once again. So she's thinking, good scientists, they ask lots of small questions to get them to the answer, right? Little small questions, not big ones, just teeny ones. Her parents calmed down and they came back to talk. To talk. They looked at the hallway and just had to gawk. No patch of bare paint could be seen on the wall. The thinking chair now was the great thinking hall. They watched their young daughter and sighed as they did. What would they do with this curious kid who wanted to know what the world was about? They smiled and whispered, we'll figure it out. Look at, she's drawn all over the wall. Please don't do that at home. I don't think your parents would uh, like that, but no drawing on the wall. You could draw on some paper. And that's what they did because that's what you do when your kid has a passion and a heart that is true. They remade their world. Now they're all in the act of helping young Ada sort fiction from fact. She asks lots of questions. How could she resist? It's all in the heart of a young scientist. Oh, so the parents are helping her out, giving her some examples. They gave her some paper here. See this chart paper instead of the wall? You may not want to stand on a ladder, though. All right. But her parents are checking it out. She's working it out. And as for the smell, what can Ada Twist do? but learn all she can with her friends in grade two. Will they discover the stink that curls toes? Well, that is the question. And someday, who knows? All her friends are gathered around. She's got her special smeller on and they all have little things in there. They're trying to figure out what exactly is happening. Why is it so stinky? All right. So that's Ada Twist, scientist. Ask lots of questions, create educated guesses, okay? All right, so I hope you've enjoyed our two books. Lots of fun. We miss you guys. Um, and uh, next week is spring break, as I said before, so we'll take a break from all of this. But um, it looks like we won't be coming back to school for a little while, so when we get back from spring break, we'll do some more reading. However, we still have three more days this week of books. At 1.30, join me for Peter and the Star Catchers. And I'll be here live. Peter and the Star Catchers will read a chapter or two. With that, thanks and go Bears! <laughs>